Former Philadelphia Mayor W. Wilson Good Sr. speaks to supporters, as protesters demonstrate in the background, during a ceremony to celebrate the naming of a street after him Friday in Philadelphia. 35 years ago this Wednesday, Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on the home of a radical black liberation group called MOVE. Now, the city's mayor at the time says another apology is due to the families of those who were targeted and killed, and the rest of the city's residents. I believe that it would be helpful at this point for current and former officials to apologize, said W. Wilson Good Sr. In a phone interview with WHYY, Good echoed what he wrote in an op-ed published Sunday in The Guardian. He said a formal apology on the 35th anniversary of the tragic bombing would help the city heal and move forward. Wilson Good, the former Philadelphia mayor in office at the time of the move bombing, wants the city to issue a formal apology. The British newspaper, The Guardian, printed an op-ed by Good, and in it he says that he led Philadelphia in 1985 when police dropped a bomb on a house occupied by members of a radical group. In that event, 11 people were killed, Wednesday marking the 35th anniversary of that bombing. And the article, Good writes that he was not personally involved in the decisions that day, but says he was still ultimately responsible for the actions of the people that he appointed. Move members, however, reject the apology idea, characterizing it as an insincere ploy. That way we can begin to build a bridge that spans from the tragic events of the past into our future, Good wrote. Many in the city still feel the pain of that day. I know I always feel the pain. Good was mayor when the bomb killed 11 MOVE members, including five children, and destroyed 61 homes in the neighborhood. Good apologized for the events that took place in West Philadelphia, noting this is the fourth time he has done so publicly, including the day after the bombing. As Philly honors former mayor with street sign, protesters assail Good's MOVE legacy. Six years ago, years of tension led to a breaking point. The fraught history between the city and the MOVE organization went back years before the incident on May 13, 1985. In 1978, police tried to evict MOVE members from another home in Powelton Village over more than a year's worth of neighbor complaints about noise and health violations. Authorities came armed with water hoses and tear gas. Police officer James Ramp was fatally shot in the altercation, who shot him remains a topic of debate, and nine MOVE members received lengthy sentences for murder. As of February, seven of the nine have been released on parole. Two others died in prison. Row houses in Philadelphia burn after authorities dropped a bomb on the MOVE house in May 1985. Seven years later, police and members of MOVE would have a much deadlier encounter. By then, the organization had set up a new home in the Cobbs Creek section of West Philly and tensions between neighbors, the city and MOVE members continued to flare over how the group lived out its radical back-to-nature philosophy. Neighbors on the 6,200 block of Osage Avenue remember MOVE members set up a stage, where some would use loudspeakers to espouse their beliefs, even in the middle of the night. Five years ago, the bombing killed almost every person in the MOVE home, only two people survived. But the damage went beyond MOVE's membership as the city made the decision to let the subsequent fire burn through dozens of row homes. In all, 61 homes were razed. It's cost tens of millions to rebuild the homes, which have only recently attracted buyers. Good said with the last of the Move 9 on parole and the upcoming 35th anniversary of the bombing, it's only appropriate for a new public apology from the city. He said the op-ed was his renewed apology, though as he has said previously, Good insisted he did not intentionally harm anyone. I did not know that the police department was going to take a helicopter and fly over the house and drop an explosive device from the helicopter to the roof, he told WHYY. I did not know they were going to let the fire burn. Good testified before an investigating commission in 1985 that he gave his permission to drop the bomb, but did not know it would be dropped from a helicopter. Brooks, the city's managing director at the time, said he had informed Good of the police department's plan before it happened. Good said he screamed at the television screen for the blaze to be put out and tried to issue the command from his office. Still, he admits the bombing and ensuing fire happened on his watch. William Richmond, fire commissioner at the time, said in 2010 that the fire which spread down the block was not extinguished immediately after the bomb because officials were worried that firefighters could face gunfire and thought it would destroy a bunker and help get people out of the house. Good said he ordered the fire to be put out, but Richmond said he never received such an order. 
One of the survivors, Ramona Africa, alleged that police opened fire on MOVE members trying to flee the burning home. MOVE members rejected the apology idea Sunday, characterizing it as an insincere ploy. No apology is going to bring back my baby or any of the children in that house or our brothers, husbands, sisters, or other victims, Sue Africa said. A newly installed street sign honoring former Philadelphia Mayor W. Wilson Good Sr. is seen Friday, September 21, 2018 in the Overbrook section of Philadelphia, council considering an apology. Though Good was re-elected and had a city street named after him in 2018, his handling of the bombing was widely criticized from the start. Fellow politicians urged him to step down and a commission found the mayor had been grossly negligent in his handling of the incident. I know I can't change the past by apologizing, but I can express my deep and sincere regrets and call upon other former and current elected officials to do so, Good wrote. I believe this action can be a small step toward healing. I apologize and encourage others do the same. We will be a better city for it. Five years ago. In addition to the op-ed he penned in The Guardian, Good is slated to speak about the bombing on WURD this Wednesday. Mayor Jim Kenney's office declined to comment at this time. City Council is considering a form of apology ahead of the anniversary. Council member Jamie Godier, who represents the West Philadelphia neighborhood, told The Guardian that she supports the effort. To this day this represents one of the most heinous acts done by a city government against its own people, not just in Philadelphia, but in the entire country. The Associated Press contributed reporting. MOVE exhibit aims to showcase who the members of the Black Liberation Group were as people. 39 years after MOVE bombing, activists remember victims of the West Philly tragedy. A survivor's tale, Mike Africa Jr.'s, on a MOVE, tells the story of the MOVE bombing. It's Philadelphia history, Africa Jr. said while discussing his new book at Temple University. It's black history. It's revolutionary history. It's American history. Nearly four decades after the MOVE bombing, survivor Mike Africa Jr.'s new book, On a MOVE, gives a first-person account of life after the tragedy, the history of the MOVE organization and Africa Jr.'s fight to free his parents from prison. Africa Jr. discussed the new release Thursday with journalist and professor Lynn Washington Jr. at the Charles Library on the campus of Temple University. When asked why he wrote the book during an interview with WHYY News, Africa Jr. said, because it needed to be done. The history of MOVE has been around for 50 years and nobody did it before, Africa Jr. said. The idea of it never being done, it didn't make sense to me, so I felt like it had to be done. On May 13, 1985, Philadelphia police dropped a military-grade bomb on the home of the MOVE organization at 6221 Osage Avenue. The fire that followed was left to burn, killing 11 people, including five children. 61 homes were razed across two blocks of a predominantly black neighborhood. Nine members of the MOVE organization were convicted for their involvement in a police shootout that killed Officer James Ramp. The MOVE 9 have always insisted they are innocent. Africa Jr.'s work to free those incarcerated began in 2016. In June and October 2018, Africa Jr.'s parents, Debbie and Mike Africa Sr., became the first two of the MOVE 9 to be released from prison. I carried the torch to free the MOVE 9 and that's kind of where my story picks up at in the book Africa Jr. said. My journey in it is there just so people get an understanding of who I am, but the bigger story is the bomb, the sentencing of nine people for a crime they didn't commit. 39 years after MOVE bombing, activists remember victims of the West Philly tragedy. It's really important for us to document this history, talk about things, and to never forget, Mike Africa Jr. said. Three months ago. Listen 120. Purged out of local memory. Washington Jr. said he had covered MOVE as a journalist for more than four decades and was on the ground when the bombing happened. He told WHYY News that day has been conscientiously purged out of local memory and thus national memory. The coverage has been a mile wide, meaning there's been a lot of coverage, but it was only an inch thick, Washington Jr. said. It was stopped at a superficial level. He said that no one really gave context to the MOVE story, the organization and the dynamics within and outside. I mean, like when we're talking about August 8, 1978, there is clear and convincing evidence that the bullet that killed the officer did not emerge from the basement, he said. 
Yvonne Orr, the daughter of Delberg Africa, one of the nine convicted, attended Thursday night's event. She reflected on her memories of what happened in Powelton Village on that day 46 years ago. She was attending grade school in Chicago when a teacher tried to pull her aside to tell her the news. I caught the flash on the black and white TV, Orr said. I was just like, that's daddy. And I just remember screaming. For me, today is the 46th anniversary of the very first time he was taken from me and that's exactly how I look at it. With the book's release this week, Orr hopes it will inform new generations who have never heard of Moves history. What I hope this book will do is put us on notice in a different kind of way just to make us aware, Orr said. And sometimes that awareness seems to draw up reflective thought that seems to draw up some type of action toward it, and then it brings about generational change, and that's what I hope it will do. It's Philadelphia history, Africa Jr. said. It's black history. It's revolutionary history. It's American history. There are so many categories that it fits in, and I think it will highlight and illuminate a lot of the dark crevices that the system has tried to keep dark. On a Move is available now in both hardcover and audiobook formats. A gathering was held Monday honoring the 11 victims of the 1985 Move bombing. The day marked 39 years since Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on the home of the Black Liberation Group Move at 6221 Osage Avenue. The fire that followed was left to burn by the fire department. It resulted in the deaths of five children and the destruction of 61 homes across two blocks of the predominantly black neighborhood. Multiple speakers, including family member Mike Africa Jr., read the names of the victims in the middle of Cobbs Creek Parkway on Monday, down the block from where the bombing happened. Africa Jr. said he didn't want those who perished to be faceless victims. Gabriel Bryant, Yane Endgo, Mike Africa Jr. and Crystal Strong gave remarks on May 13, 2024, down the street from where the move bombing occurred in 1985. Our people weren't just names, they were people, he said. They had lives, they had dreams, they had interests, they had feelings. They were taken, snuffed out. They were murdered. It's really important for us to document this history, to talk about these things, and to never forget. If you forget, history is bound to repeat itself. 500 police officers were present in, flat jackets, tear gas, SWAT gear, .50 and .60 caliber machine guns, and an anti-tank machine gun, according to the MOVE investigation report. The fire department flooded the home to force the occupants to leave. When that failed, police used explosives to gain entry through the front and adjacent walls, then pumped tear gas into the home. Several shots were fired from the MOVE home at the officers. Officers returned fire, sending 10,000 rounds into the home. Following a 12-hour standoff, at 5 p.m., Mayor Wilson Good approved the use of explosives to destroy the bunker on top of the house. No one was ever criminally charged for the bombing. The names of the child victims are Tommaso, Boo, Levino, Delisha Orr, Zanetta Dotson, Phil Phillips and Katricia, Tree, Dotson. The adults were Teresa Brooks, Frank James, John Africa, Raymond Foster, James Conrad Hampton and Rhonda Ward. Africa Jr. said while the bomb itself received a lot of attention, the real issue is murder. It wouldn't be what it is without the murders. Eleven people were murdered and then their bodies were stolen by pen and used as research material and teaching material at Princeton, Africa said. It could happen again. We look back at the 1985 MOVE bombing in Philadelphia after the recent discovery around the mishandling and the disposal of MOVE victim remains. In 2021, it was reported the University of Pennsylvania possessed the remains of child victims Katricia and Zanetta Dotson without the knowledge of their relatives. Their brother sued the city and the university in 2022 for tortious interference of a dead body and emotional distress, among other charges. Yane Endgo said what happened 39 years ago was unthinkable and unacceptable and that those impacted will always stand in remembrance of the people. We are here to remember and honor the people who were not treated as people, not considered as people, not remembered as people when the city of Philadelphia decided not only that they were going to drop a bomb, but that they were going to let the fire burn, Endgo said. Not only did they let the fire burn, but they shot bullets at people as they moved to escape. Endgo added she believes everyone in Philadelphia should remember this moment.
Same way you decide you're not going to take the parkway on July 4th, unless you want to be in the July 4th activities, and go said. On May 13th at this time, you need to be thinking this is a time when the city is remembering what happened to MOVE, and, I'm here to celebrate, commemorate, remember their lives. The MOVE bombing was traumatic. Learning what happened to the bodies is, too. After the MOVE bombing, the city of Philadelphia held some of the remains for 36 years. Then the answers kept changing, and things got infinitely worse. Three years ago, Philadelphia City Council passed a resolution in 2020 apologizing for the attack, which was rejected by MOVE via a statement on X, formerly Twitter, and demanded the release of Mumia Abu-Jamal from prison. In 2018, two members of the MOVE 9 convicted of killing police officer James Ramp in a shootout in Philadelphia's Powelton Village neighborhood in 1978 were released from prison. From Thursday through Sunday, guided tours of the MOVE the Old Days exhibit will take place at the Paul Robeson House and Museum at 4951 Walnut Street in Philadelphia. By August of 1978, we hoped that an overpowering police presence would intimidate move to peaceful surrender. For May 13th was the most conservative, controlled, disciplined and safe operation that we could devise based upon these lessons. William Richmond, late Friday, I get a call that there was a meeting at the police administration building on Saturday morning. At the meeting, we were told that Samber would make a pronouncement by Bullhorn for move to exit the house. If they didn't exit, we'd start the squirts and throw water at quite a volume to neutralize the bunkers. Then the police would get the tear gas in. But we hadn't been out there. The planning was terrible. James Bergeyer, we were going to breach walls in the basement and second floors and use tear gas, leaving the first floor as an escape for move people. And I think, I'm okay with this. Theodore Price. On Sunday, May 12, 1985, the police told us that we had to go somewhere and stay. I went to a hotel on Baltimore Avenue. Ramona, Africa. We knew something big was about to happen. Police told people to go out and visit family, that they could come back the next night. Boy, were they wrong. Michael Nutter. In 1985, I was Councilman Ortiz's chief of staff. He asked me to look into the situation that Sunday. There were police barricades, news vans, and a general sense of tension in the air. I talked through a screen door with Ramona Africa. She expressed that the family was upset about the members locked up, and they were prepared to take whatever actions necessary to try to make their release happen. Soon, there was increasing presence by the police, specialized officers, SWAT teams. I was out there most of the night. Tommy Meller, we get out to the house at 4 or 5 a m on Monday. It was very quiet, dark, eerie. I was carrying a tear gas machine. William Richmond, I rode out on the square truck. This was the first time I had seen the bunker or Osage. We positioned on 62nd Street. That's when we saw the trees in our way, and I thought, the squirts aren't going to reach. Michael Nutter, police presence significantly increased again. The power had been turned off. And then the commissioner made an announcement that the folks should come out of the house. William Richmond, I'll never forget it. This is America, he started. Ramona Africa, he said, attention, move. This is America. You have to abide by the laws and rules of America. Frank Powell, then one of them gets on the loudspeaker and calls the commissioner a Michael Nutter, at some point, what sounded like gunfire broke out. People were running for cover. William Richmond, once the shooting started, we turned on the squirts, but they were too far. We couldn't neutralize those bunkers. Tommy Meller, what major city lets people build a bunker on their roof? You try to build a fence and L and I will shut you down. William Richmond, the bunkers were critical. They overlooked everything. High ground, in military parlance. Ramona, Africa. Firefighters are sworn to protect life, but they were the first phase of the attack. The water was pouring into the house, and then we heard that the police were going to try to use tear gas. James Bergeyer, we used the charge in the wall next door, and Tommy Meller started to put the pipe through but hit something. Tommy Meller, we didn't realize how well fortified the house was. I could barely make a dent in it to get the tear gas in. James Bergeyer, they had walls inside of walls. 
But we did get through and get gas on for a bit. Mark Lamont Hill, Columbia University professor and former Fox News correspondent, I was only seven, living in Germantown. During the day, as things developed, the teachers were talking about it. I remember one was crying. They were upset. Michael Moses Ward, formerly Birdie Africa, in 1985 testimony before the MOVE Commission, we was in the cellar for a while, and tear gas started coming in and we got the blankets. They was wet. And then we put them over our heads and started laying down. Ramona Africa, they were shooting. They knew there was children. They had arrest warrants, yes, but we hadn't been convicted of anything. And what they claimed to be arresting us for was not capital offenses. They had artillery of war. M16s. Sidearms. Sniper rifles with silencers. James Bergeyer. The bomb guys were using some sort of charge to try to breach the wall. We attempted to get back into the neighboring house, but the way it was explained to me, move violated the integrity of the house by knocking down joists. The first floor of the house we had been in collapsed. My father never had much respect for Samber. People thought my dad was excessive, but Samber ran around in fatigues. Dad heard that they were planning to drop an explosive. Frank Powell, around 4 or 5 p.m., they call me into a meeting. Samber asks if we could use a helicopter to blow the bunker off. I don't know, I say. I never dropped a bomb out of a helicopter. What happens if they shoot the helicopter down and it lands on a house? What happens if I miss? James Bergeyer, we hear that a helicopter is going to drop a bomb. We're supposed to take a defensive position. I blew it off. You're not going to drop a bomb. Tommy Meller, they had pulled us out of the house, so I went to Cobbs Creek Parkway. Ducking bullets all day tires you out. I went to sleep in the dirt. Somebody woke me up, and I heard they were going to throw a device to knock the bunker off. Of all the strange things going on then, it didn't seem strange. Gregor Samber, in testimony, the use of the device itself gives me the least pause. It was selected as a conservative and safe approach to what I perceived as a tactical necessity. I was assured that the device would not harm the occupants. What has imprinted that device on the mind of the city is, in fact, the method of delivery. If it had been carried or thrown into position or if it had been dropped from a crane, the perception of that action would be quite different. William Richmond, so the decision was made to take a helicopter and use a satchel charge, that's the term for explosives in a gym bag. The helicopter made two or three passes with Frank Powell strapped in. Frank Rizzo Jr., I'll never forget it. My father was in the family room, watching it all on TV. When he saw the state police helicopter, all the intelligence he had started coming together, and he said, son, they're going to drop a bomb on this headquarters. Frank Powell, as soon as I dropped the satchel, the pilot got the hell out. The rotor wash blew it across the roof. I said, oh shit. And then it went off. There was a football shaped hole. It missed the bunker. Michael Ward, in testimony, that is when the big bomb went off. It shook the whole house up. William Richmond, Frank dropped it, which took a lot of moxie. The concussion knocked out windows of nearby homes. Debris went everywhere. Minutes later, someone said to me there was a fire on the roof. These things start small and build up over time. Ed Rendell, when I heard that they used an incendiary device on the roof, I was amazed because you could clearly see drums of oil up there. And it would seem to me to have been lunacy under those circumstances to drop an incendiary device. But they did. And as the afternoon rolled on and the fire started, it became almost a holocaust. Frank Rizzo Jr., when my father saw the fire department shut the water off, he couldn't believe that anyone in the U.S. would use fire to force people from a building. William Richmond, originally, the police wanted to access the property via the hole in the roof. We couldn't leave the squirts on, because we'd wash off police attempting to breach. And the squirts caused a tremendous amount of smoke, the fear was that MOVE members would exit shooting from different locations. There was a managing director's directive in place. One commander in place, the police commissioner. We were under authority of police. James Bergeyer, there's so much fire and smoke. We can't tell what's gunshots and what's windows popping. And we hear over the radio that someone is coming out. 
Tommy Meller, and then Ramona comes out, surrounded by smoke. And Bertie comes out next. James Bergeyer, it was like fantasy. Like he came out of fire. He was barefoot. Ramona tried to pick him up but lost her grip. He landed on his head, I scooped him up. And Tommy took Ramona into custody. Tommy Meller, by this time, the fire had already spread to other houses. Angel Ortiz, I was coming out the back of the art museum with Ed Rendell and my wife. We saw the plume of smoke, and Ed and I looked at each other. It was one hell of a fire. Ed Rendell, later that night was the spring democratic dinner over at the Franklin Plaza, and we watched the houses in flames on one of the little TVs in the bar. Seth Williams, my friends and I watched the fire in disbelief. It went from a minor tragedy to a catastrophic event. Eleven of my classmates lost their homes. Tigra Hill, I came home from Archbishop Carroll. I lived, and still live, in Winfield. It was on TV, and from my house, which is a distance away, I could see the smoke. My mother and I, we were just so stunned. Theodore Price, we had no idea what was going on, so we checked out of our hotel on Monday. When we got to the street, there was a whole lot of action. And after they dropped it, the fire starts trickling to each house. Boom, boom, boom. Sam Katz, I was landing in an airplane in South Philly, and the sky was bright orange. I had no idea what it was. But it was a remarkable scene from up there. Then I was on the ground in my car, with KYW on. The whole thing just careened completely out of control. Theodore Price, it burned 61 houses. It looked like a war zone. My house was completely destroyed. I had just put in new siding and picture windows. I lived in that house since 1957. It was bought and paid for. Wilson Good, in a press conference that night, I stand fully accountable for the action that took place tonight. I will not try to place any blame on any one of my subordinates. I was aware of what was going on, and therefore, I support them in terms of their decisions. And therefore, the people of the city will have to judge the mayor, in fact, of what happened. Gregor Samber, in testimony, I remain convinced that any approach on May 13th would have presented an immediate and deadly danger. It remains a fact that if MOVE members had simply come out of the building, they would be alive today. But they announced that morning that they would never surrender and that they would kill as many of us as they could. Hill, I've talked to Good. He regrets his actions. I would argue that it's the biggest regret he has in his life. It haunts him. I wouldn't be surprised if his move to the clergy was prompted by his deep sense of regret and guilt. Sam Katz, I don't want to point the finger at who should be punished, but there was a moral breakdown here, both in the act and the aftermath. I think it affected Good profoundly. Wilson Good, in a 2004 interview with Philadelphia Magazine, in the whole scheme of things, move was a bad day. It was a really bad day. On March 6, 1986, the 11 member Philadelphia Special Investigation Commission, or MOVE Commission, issued a report condemning city officials, stating dropping a bomb on an occupied row house was unconscionable. No criminal charges were filed against anyone in city government. Wilson Good was re elected to a second term. A burned Ramona Africa served seven years in prison for charges relating to the May 13th confrontation. Following her 1992 release, she won a civil case against the city for $500,000. Michael Ward was reunited with his father, Andina Ward, and later won a $1.5 million judgment against the city. The 250 residents who lost their homes had yet another saga to endure, rebuilding, a process plagued by patronage, politics and incompetence. It continues to this day. Many of the police officers involved were profoundly affected by their experience. James Bergeyer quickly left the force due to post-traumatic stress disorder. Another officer committed suicide. As you leave the page, don't forget to hit the like bell and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so as yet. Thank you for watching.